Support for this program is brought to you by Genentech, the makers of Abismo, Farisimab SVOA. There's more to explore. Discover all the data at vibismo hcp.com. That's V A B Y S M O hcp.com. Is Avacyn Captad Pegel effective in patients with major ellipsoid zone attenuation at baseline? I'm Greg Notstein, he's Scott Kriswanis, and this is New Retina Radio from Retina Today and Bryn Mawr Communications. Dr. Catherine Talcott stopped by our studio in Stockholm during ASRS with a top-line summary of her lecture at this year's meeting. And Dr. Sunir Garg joined me for a conversation about the Gale study, which assessed 36 months of continuous dosing of pegcetacoplin. What did microperimetry findings reveal about long-term dosing with C3 inhibition? Join us on this episode to find out. In the GATHER studies, assessing geographic atrophy and avacin captad pegol researchers assessed baseline and post-treatment ellipsoid zone data. Dr. Catherine Talcott, or Kat Talcott, shared those data at this year's ASRS meeting. Dr. Talcott is a retina specialist at the Cole Eye Institute and is joining us at our mobile studio in Stockholm. Her work was conducted with the team at the Tony and Leona Campane Image Guided Surgery and Advanced Imaging Lab. Dr. Talcott, welcome to New Retina Radio. Thanks so much for having me. I'm old enough to remember when the ellipsoid zone was called the inner segment, outer segment junction. Remind our listeners exactly what the ellipsoid zone is when we're talking about geographic atrophy. Yeah, it seems like there's a different name for this layer in these cells like every couple of years. <laughs> yeah, but there's a lot of attention played on, on the ellipsoid zone now. So it's good to sort of know what it, what it, what it is. Um, so it's a hyperreflective autoretinal band that we can see on OCT. Um, and generally, we care about the ellipsoid zone because a functional EZ is really linked with good vision. And if we see signs that there's attenuation of the EZ on OCT imaging, it may indicate that in general, patients can have advancing disease of a number of reasons. So in the case of dry AMD, um, if there's ellipsoid zone outside of the area of GA, this has been linked to the area of GA or like atrophy actually growing faster. So this means that really EZ attenuation can actually be an early sign that one could potentially look at to see if someone's at an elevated risk for having their GA grow faster. So to find out if this is the case, we took advantage of um, clinical trial data that exists, and we looked back at GATHER1 and GATHER2 to be able to assess if ACP, um, to be able to tell if baseline easy metrics are linked with GA growth rate, as well as to be able to see if ACP was effective at being able to reduce GA growth rate in patients who have more easy attenuation at baseline. In GATHER1 and GATHER2, in this post hoc analysis, you categorized uh, easy attenuation Can you tell me how you split those into different groups? So that's something that we did in this post hoc analysis is um, we divided um, the patients into those four different categories based on growth rate. And then we used four different easy metrics to be able to um, see if there were changes and correlate that with growth rate. So one of the metrics that we looked at was easy uh, attenuation, which is um, calculating the like percentage area of a macular cube where the easy to RP distance is either zero microns or less than 20 microns. Okay. Additionally, we also looked at another metric called easy GA gap, um, which is the area where there's easy attenuation in a macular cube minus the area where there's geographic atrophy. So this metric really gets at looking at area outside of geographic atrophy um, to be able to see if there's any easy uh, attenuation in these areas. And this can really vary a lot depending on the individual patient. Okay, so we're comparing growth rates with easy attenuation and easy GA gaps. What did you find when you looked at the data? We found that when we looked at all these easy metrics, we found um, that uh, patients that there was a significant difference between the patients who had the fastest um, growth rate of their GA and the patients who had the slowest growth rate. Mm-hmm. Um, so that indicates to us that um, the patients who have um, Uh, increase in these metrics at baseline. So more easy attenuation or um, easy GA uh, gap are at um, risk for having a faster rate um, of growth of their geographic atrophy. We found this to be the same if we were looking at the sham treated eyes or the ACP treated eyes. And then what about the eyes that had the greatest ellipsoid zone burden at baseline, the ones that were in the worst shape? Was avacin captad pegol able to affect their disease course or were they too far gone? 
Yes, um, we looked at that. So in the patients who had um, the greatest um, risk of having GA growth, um, and by virtue of that had the greatest easy uh, burden at baseline, we found that ACP was able to significantly reduce GA growth at month 12. So for the patients who had total easy uh, attenuation, they had a 24% decrease in growth rate if they were treated with ACP. If it was partial easy attenuation, they had a 30% decrease. And if they had a total easy gap, um, uh, they had a 19% decrease if they were treated with ACP versus sham. So really across these three different um, baseline easy metrics, we, we we found that ACP was effective in slowing growth rate of okay. GA. I mean, that's good news for these you know patients who have uh, some pretty rough anatomy, I guess. So what is the purpose of these data? What do we do with this? So we have, you know, your presentation was very interesting. Are providers actually assessing easy attenuation or are they looking at easy GA gaps when they're in the clinic? I mean, you guys are very busy. So what do we do with these data, if anything? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. I think the reason that we were interested in sort of doing this project in the first place is there's a big need. Um, we're seeing patients in clinic um, and we have to, we have treatment that's now available to uh, patients and we need to be able to assess who's the right patient to start um, treatment on and if those treatments are working. Um, it feels like often in clinic, like the tools we have available, just OCT and fundus autofluorescent aren't great at being able to tease that apart. So the main role of doing the study was really to develop better easy metrics that could tell us who's actually going to um, have progression of their GA or not. And I think that's what these um, what what our study did is it really helped to validate these metrics as well as to be able to show that ACP was working in some of these patients. The hard thing is that these metrics are not just ready to go prime time in clinic yet. Yeah, they're really cumbersome. They're very cumbersome. They take a lot of people hard time to segment OCTs um, to make sure that um, all the layers are identified. But the goal is to get closer to that. So something like having a machine learning or an AI based algorithm that would incorporate being able to read an OCT and come up with these numbers would be really helpful. Helpful. So this is part of that process. We're just not there yet. AI to the rescue. All right, uh, Dr. Talcott, thanks for joining us on New Retina Radio. Thank you so much for having me. Support for this program is brought to you by Genentech, the makers of Abysmo, Farisimab SVOA. There's more to explore Discover all the data at vibismo-hcp.com. That's V-A-B-Y-S-M-O-HCP.com. The Gale Extension Study assessed peg coplan out to 36 months in patients with geographic atrophy, and it's yielded insights into how the drug might behave in patients who have been continuously dosed for three years. Dr. Sunir Garg presented Gale data at ASRS this year, Specifically, he discussed pre-specified microperimetry endpoints in Gale. He's in our mobile studio in Stockholm here with me to tell us more. Dr. Garg is a member of the Retina Service at Will's Eye Hospital in my hometown of Philadelphia. Dr. Garg, welcome to the show. Thank you, Scott. It's a pleasure to be here. Let's start at the top. Remind us how Gale was designed. So as you may recall, the Oaks and Derby studies were very large prospective phase three studies on patients with geographic atrophy. They followed patients out to 24 months. The Gale is an extension study that's actually go for additional three years and follow those patients to see how we do over time. We've known for a while that conventional measurements of visual function, like visual acuity, for example, inadequately assess changes to vision in GA patients. I understand that microperimetry testing could address some of those concerns or fill in some of those gaps. Remind us what microperimetry is and how it relates to geographic atrophy. So that's one of the challenges in this space. We're used to looking at patients with diabetes or wet macular degeneration, where vision is a great endpoint. And we know that because you give a patient a couple of anti-VEGF injections and they come in a month or two later and they can see better. But geographic atrophy is tougher, especially if our patients come in with good baseline acuity. When you look at these eyes, you know their, their fovea can be fine until the very, very end. And so although patients will say that their quality of vision is deteriorating, on the Snellen chart, they still may be 20, 40 for years until the vision suddenly starts to drop off. And our uh, visual acuity outcomes really aren't a good measure for this. We've looked at other things such as reading speed and low lumens visual acuity, and none of those really work very well. So we've relied on anatomic measures like, like fundus autofluorescence as well as OCT, which are great markers, but they don't measure what's actually happening in terms of visual function and what the patients are experiencing. And microperimetry can potentially help kind of map out the scotomas that we're seeing on 
examination with what the patient's describing to us in real life. And microperimetry is sort of like a microscopic visual field rather than testing the entire retina. It basically is focused on the macula. It has 68 points. It registers areas. So once the patient, sort of like an OCT, once the patient takes the test once, the computer will kind of lock the grid in in the same area of the macula. Oh, I see. So that when retesting occurs, you're truly retesting the same area. The same area. Yep. And then it takes about eight to 10 minutes to do per eye. It can be a little bit tedious for patients. So most of us use it in part of research protocols, less commonly used in clinical practice, but it's a really precise kind of endpoint in measuring folks for change over time. I see. So now in this study, what you presented on the podium uh, in Stockholm, you were looking at mean change from baseline in the number of total scotomatous points on microperimetry at two time points, right? Month 30 and month 36. Can you tell me what you and your colleagues found? Yeah. So if we kind of go back a little bit in time, when there's 68 points, one of the challenges in geographic atrophy is if patients already come in with areas of atrophy, the points in those areas of atrophy aren't going to change. There's blank today, they're going to be blank three years from now. And then if you have healthy macula way out in the corners, during a two to three year study, those areas are probably not going to get involved. So those, study, those areas really aren't useful for statistical analysis. So the first thing that we did is looked at area around the atrophy. We call that the junctional zone because those are the cells that would most likely be affected during a two to three year study. And we found that eyes that received pegsetocoplin had slowing of damage in that junctional zone. So that was really interesting. Okay. Then we looked at the kind of central four points. That was another post hoc analysis. And what we found is that pegsetocoplin reduces the likelihood of that central part of your vision, that central two degree field from becoming an absolute scotoma. And we looked at a larger 16 or four by four grid and pegsetocoplin was also associated with a much lower chance of developing absolute scotoma in your kind of central macula. But we didn't have enough follow-up to be able to see what happened in all 68 points cumulatively. When we started analyzing this 18 months, there was some minor trend towards favoring treatment. At 24 and 30 months, we saw more of that. And at 36 months in a pre-specified analysis, we were able to see a statistically significant reduction in the total number of scotomatous points in eyes that receive pegsetocoplin monthly, which is the first time that's ever been shown in any FDA-approved product for GA. So it's really cool. And the treatment effect widening or becoming more pronounced over time, I mean, this is something we saw in the phase three studies also, right? Yeah. So that basic idea of there seems to be increasing benefit over time played out in terms of the fundus autofluorescence, seems to be playing out in some of the OCT data, and is now playing out in microperimetry. So all of these things are kind of all marching in the same direction, which is also really reassuring. So all these data are interesting, uh, but like you said, microperimetry not really used in a clinical setting. Uh, I'm curious about the so what of this. Like, What does this mean for clinicians who are already giving their patients pegsetocoplan or slow to adopt but considering pegsetocoplan? Where does this fit into the actual decision-making matrix for your colleagues? So I think this is hugely important data for a couple of reasons. Number one, we can now say that there's increasing benefit to treatment over time. Number two, there was always some concern about the previous data that it was a post hoc analysis. You know, you're taking the data set that you have and you're slicing and dicing it. And then people would say, well, that really doesn't have the statistical rigor of a pre-specified input. Oh, sure. Part of your statistical analysis plan, you say, you know what, these are one of the things I'm going to look at. And so in a pre-specified analysis, we're meeting that endpoint. So that's really a big deal. Number three, everything's marching in the same direction. So what we're seeing anatomically, and if you look at those graphs over time, are really matching up with what we see on microperimetry. So that's very important. And then we can say that we're impacting functions. So one of the potential criticisms of the anatomic data is people would say, well, it's great that you're slowing change on autofluorescence, but how do we know that those cells that are being protected are actually functional? Well, now I have functional data to say, you know what? The cells that are being protected in autofluorescence are functional cells. I They're see. They're not zombie cells that are just wandering the universe. So that's really compelling data too, which I'm hopeful will allow people time to kind of reevaluate their treatment algorithms for these eyes, particularly if they really haven't been treating patients so far. Understood. Dr. Garg, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you for having me.
That concludes our first episode of meeting coverage from ASRS 2024 in Stockholm. Many thanks to Drs. Talcott and Garg. But stick around, folks. We have two more episodes of coverage coming to you soon. That's right. And be sure to get them by liking or subscribing to the podcast in your podcast platform of choice. And if you really liked the episode, share it on social. It helps us get this episode out to your colleagues. 